Let me read to you Matthew chapter 21 and beginning in verse number one. It says this. It says, now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village in, the front, in front of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied on a, and a colt with her. Unite them and bring them to me. Verse three, if anyone says anything to you, you shall say the Lord needs them and he will send them at once. Verse four, this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet saying, uh, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey and a colt and a foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. Verse seven, they brought the donkey and the colt and put them on the cloak and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Verse nine, and the crowd that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of money, the changers, and the seats of those who sold pigeons, verse 13. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies? You have prepared praise, verse 17. And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. This is the word of the Lord for us this morning. May we position ourselves now under its authority and may we allow it to speak to us in a way that will move us and direct us and help us to follow and know Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. May it do its work now, Father, we pray. God, we ask and pray that you would work like only you can. God, we ask and pray that you would move, Lord, in a way that would only be pleasing to you, Father. I ask and pray that, God, you would um, help me to say everything you want to be said. And I pray you keep back from my lips anything you not want to be spoken. Teach us, help us, grow us for your honor and for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If we were to sum up this passage that we just read, we call it here the sermon in a sentence. What's the big idea of this passage? What's the sermon in a sentence? It's, it's this, if you're taking notes, Jesus establishes divine truths prior to his death that disrupts a religious system. Jesus is establishing some divine truths prior to this Holy Week. This is the beginning of Holy Week prior to his death. That's going to happen on Good Friday that disrupts a religious system. Jesus is ushered into Jerusalem on a donkey. He is praised and glorified as the son of David, the one who would save us. Hosanna, the one that would send a deliverance. And he comes into a city that is in need of salvation. At that time, the Jews in Jerusalem were oppressed and were being held captive and were being overwhelmed by the Roman authorities. And many people in that time were looking for someone who was Jewish to come in and overthrow Rome. And these Jewish people that some of them may have believed that Jesus was the Messiah. Others, I believe, think, uh, believe that they, he thought that he was the one that would free them from Roman oppression. Either way, here is this moment that has culminated where Jesus is riding in their savior you're the one that's going to kick Rome out of the city. And in this moment, these people are in need of a savior. In this moment, this city is looking for salvation and it is wrapped up in a system of religion that doesn't bring salvation. It is vain at best. It is attempting to provide something that it can't. And we see that Jesus comes in and he establishes some truths and then he leaves. 
It's almost as if he took the time to make sure they understood who he was and what was going to happen. He had to disrupt some things. He had to disrupt and shake up the order and the religious process in order to establish some divine truths. And we see in this early part of this holy week that as this city was looking for a savior, as these people were looking for salvation, that Jesus comes and provides truths that would establish him as the only true savior. You see, what Jesus says and does in this passage on this Palm Sunday establishes truths that impact and influence all of our lives. And you may be sitting here today saying, that's great, I'm glad as a pastor, you're excited about Palm Sunday. I'm sure all pastors should be excited about Palm Sunday, but you know, I work in the corporate world or I'm a stay-at-home mom or I'm a single person, I'm a teenager. So what, what is the big deal about these truths that Jesus established? Understand, don't miss this, that Jesus is not just establishing these truths about himself for these people because these truths are divine, they are eternal and the truths that he establishes on this day affect you today. They are not vain. They are not worthless. They are not wasted. If you're a, a parent here concerned about your children, these truths will give you peace. If you're a, uh, dealing with a mental health in your life, maybe depression or PTSD or anxiety or loneliness or something in your life that you're going through that nobody knows about that you're dealing with that's overwhelming you, some mental health issue, if you are going through that, these truths that he establishes can guide you through in that journey. If you are a, a businessman and you're worried about the future and you see the stock market and you're wondering what's gonna happen and you keep hearing the word recession, recession, recession and you're thinking what's gonna happen, how my investment's gonna pan out and you're worried these truths can help bring you the comfort that you need if you're in a relationship and you're trying to figure out which way to go, should we continue to move forward, should we break up, should we uh, get married, how, can, how do we make this all work? These truths will help you and give you clarity in the next step. If you're in a marriage that maybe isn't thriving and it's sort of stagnant and your spouse isn't really interested and you're wondering what to do next and you're overwhelmed and you're burdened and you're emotionally drained, these truths can help you make it through and help you overcome. If you are looking for a relationship with God and you're not sure where to go, you're trying to be a good person, you're trying to be moral, you're trying to come to church, you're trying to help people, you're trying to be religious, my friend, these truths will give you clarity in what it means to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, are we understanding the importance of these truths yet? That it is more than just something that Jesus established at a temple on a Sunday, but the truths impact and influence your life where you are today. Now, I know some of you are thinking, all right, Pastor Steve, well, what are the truths? <laughs> you know, I'd like to know them. Yeah, if, you, if you give them to me. We see here this morning, there's three truths that were established on Palm Sunday that we wanna walk through. Number one, Jesus established that he is the fulfillment of God's promises. We see this in verse number one. We see a detailed plan shared by Jesus. Notice in verse number one, it says this. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples saying, go into the village in the front of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied in a colt with her, Un untie them, and bring them to me. Verse three, if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord needs them and he will send them at once. It's interesting that as they're getting ready to walk in, I mean, this is a big moment for Jesus. I mean, he's done miracles, he's healed people, he's raised the dead. And as you follow the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you see that this is the culmination. I mean, this is like the big moment. I mean, it's like a, a bride at a wedding. I mean, everything's been laid out. The, the, the cake is done, the photographer is ready, the guest are there and this is her moment where the doors are gonna open up and music's gonna play and she's gonna everyone's gonna stand and she's gonna walk in and all of a sudden at the last moment before this moment this beautiful triumphal entry happens Jesus says hey can somebody go get me a donkey it's like hey, Jesus we believe you're the son of God and I mean if you need a donkey you know just just let us know you know why, why you need a donkey I'm not gonna tell you why but here's what I want you to do. There's another town. I want you to go to it. There's a donkey. 
that's tied up next to a colt. I want you to go take it. Does he want us to steal the donkey? It's like, Jesus, you're the son of God. You know, was, thou shalt not steal. Remember that? Your father made that commandment. I want you to take the donkey. If anybody gives you any trouble, you tell them the Lord has need of it. Aren't you? Don't you wish you could have that excuse, right? You know what I mean? I need a Starbucks, please. The Lord has need of it. I don't need to pay. The Lord told me that I could just take it. Thank you very much, right? And Jesus says, hey, just tell him the Lord has need of it. And we see this detailed plan that Jesus in this moment, why would he, when he's about to enter in Jerusalem, he's about to be the conqueror, he's about to overcome Rome, he's about to be the savior, he's looking for a donkey in the next town, he wants us to go get it, why? It's a detailed plan and he gives specific details and we see why in verse number four, we see a detailed promise fulfilled by Jesus. Look at verse number four, it says this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet saying, Say, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of the beast of burden. Now understand that Jesus is, 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 is asking them to get a donkey because he is referring to the scripture that is in Zechariah chapter nine and verse number nine, where it says this, it says, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation. Is he humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foil of a donkey? See, some of you thought that he just rode on a donkey because that's what they had back then. If, he, if they had a Tesla, he'd probably ride in a Tesla. But no, they had a donkey. And so he wrote a donkey. Let me tell you something right now. Jesus doesn't just do things on happenstance. Understand this, that Jesus is not just trying to you know, put his finger in the wind and say, well, what should we do today? There is intentionality in all that Jesus does. And in this moment, we see, watch this now, even the smallest promise was fulfilled. And in this moment, as he goes and gets the donkey and the disciples come back and he sits on the donkey, he is fulfilling a Messiah prophecy that if you knew the law and you were a Jew and you studied the law and you looked out your window and you saw him on a donkey, you'd be like, yo, Zechariah 9, 9. <laughs> you see, Jesus is the fulfillment. And if Jesus will fulfill this prophecy, the smallest, one of the smallest ones, then we have to understand that what he's trying to establish here is that he is the fulfillment of all of the promises of God. If he'll fulfill the smallest one, He'll fulfill the bigger ones. He'll fulfill all the ones. And we understand here, this was a detailed promise fulfilled by Jesus. Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promises about the Messiah. If you look in the Old Testament, in the first half of the Bible, you'll see all kinds of prophecies from Isaiah. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. The Bible talks all uh, uh, in the Old Testament about these Old Testament prophecies about a coming Messiah. And my friend, the morning I stand here to tell you on this Palm Sunday that Jesus Christ fulfilled all of the prophecies that were promised about the Messiah if you just do a quick glance there's over 350 Old Testament prophecies that Jesus Christ is the perfect fulfilled promise as the Messiah even the smallest one of riding in on a donkey I don't miss this Understand what Jesus is establishing here. He's establishing that God, when God makes a promise, he will fulfill it. That there is no word that God has spoken that will go unanswered. There is no sentence that God has uttered. There is no promise that God has made that will be swept away. All will be fulfilled. And my friend this morning, all was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. God promised you peace and he sent Jesus. God promised you joy and he sent Jesus. God promised you salvation and he sent you Jesus. God promised you purpose and Jesus came. God promised you life and Jesus came. All the promises that God has made to you this morning are fulfilled in one name. That is the name of Jesus this morning. Oh, I'll tell you. And I'm a little excited about that, to be honest with you. Amen. Understand this morning, some of you are waiting for God to come through. 
and you're holding on to a promise, can I tell you that promise has already been fulfilled in Jesus. You're waiting for God to provide. My friend, God's already provided in Jesus. You're waiting for God to give you rest. My friend, Jesus says, come unto me, all you that labor, heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Understand this, this, what he establishes when those religious leaders looked up and they heard the crowd chanting and the palm branches waving and they looked up and they said, he's on a donkey. They knew exactly what Jesus was establishing, <laughs> that he is the fulfillment of all of God's promises. I want you to notice here the response of the disciples in verse number six. It says, the disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. Verse seven, they brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks and he sat on them. Just a quick note there. I want you to notice the response of the disciples there. They didn't question. They just obeyed. Absolutely, Jesus. You see, when you understand who Jesus is, then you're willing to do what Jesus says. And oftentimes in our lives, we hesitate to follow Jesus and to obey Jesus because we don't have a clear picture of who he is. That he is not just the carpenter's son. He's not just a good moral teacher. My friend, he is the fulfilled promise of the Messiah from God. In that moment, the disciples said, say no more, Jesus. We'll run to the town. We'll get the donkey because we believe that you are the fulfilled promise of God. But I want you to notice the detailed parade celebrating Jesus. Verse 8. We see the preparation for the parade. It says, most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road and others cut branches from the tree and spread them on the road. We see they began to prepare for this beautiful parade of praise and they cut down branches and laid down their cloaks because the, the king was coming in. Their savior was coming through. We see the praise during the parade. In verse number nine, it says, and the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna, to the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. I want you to notice the decibel level of their praise. The Bible says they were shouting. They, they, weren't, they weren't like sort of whispering. They were shouting. Hosanna in the highest to the son of David. He has come. There was a decibel level. There was some excitement about their praise. They didn't just sit there. They weren't, they weren't telling everybody, shh, quiet. We're around the Messiah. And I'm telling you, there is a decibel level. They shouted. You know, the Bible says that we ought to shout when we praise God. We ought to make some noise when we praise God. I know some of you in this room, maybe it's your first time here. You, you know, been here and you thinking, man, they're getting like really excited. Of course we do. The Bible tells us to. And I know some of us have come from church where it's like, hey, we're in church, shh, quiet. We don't want to wake God up, right? We don't want to scare him. So quiet. Let me remind you what the Bible says. The Bible says in Psalms 47, verse one, clap your hands, all people. Shout to God with a loud song of joy. Understand that God is calling us as believers in Christ to praise him in the same way that they praised him when they cried out, Hosanna. The Bible says they shouted. The Bible says in Psalm chapter 111 and verse number one and two, it says, praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the, to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright, in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord studied by all who delight in him. Understand, listen, I know some of you say, well, it's just not, it's just not my personality. And that's okay, right? I'm an extrovert. I'm an emotional guy, right? I get excited about everything. So it's a little bit easier for me. I know some of us aren't like that. For some, I'm like your worst nightmare, right? <laughs> I'm the guy you don't want to sit next to on a plane. You're like, don't talk to me. Like, here he comes, you know? I just wanna be introverted and quiet and I just don't want to talk to anybody because I, I don't like people. And here comes old Pastor Steve. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> right? I understand that our personalities are different, but don't tell me that there's not something that can excite you. And I think sometimes what we, if we're not careful, we'll professionalize Christianity. Right, right, right. 
and we'll check all the boxes and there ought to be something. Listen, this morning, if you got a phone call from your doctor and they reached out to you and they said, we have some bad news, it's cancer. It's a rare form of cancer. And there's only one person in the country, one doctor that can operate on you that might save you. There is no other way. It's this operation or nothing else. And they reach out to that doctor and he says, well, tell me about the patient. And they say, it's pretty bad. It looks like it's gonna be stage four. It looks like there's a slim chance. And doc, you're the only one that knows the procedure for this rare form of cancer to be able to heal it. And then they, the doctor says, okay, I, I, I'll do it. I, I'll perform the surgery. I'll, I'll make sure. And, and then the doctor says, and then you say, well, how much is it gonna cost? And, then, and they say, well, it's gonna cost about $5 million for this rare surgery. And at that moment, you have some hope that there is a chance you could, you could be healed, but you can't afford to pay the price. And imagine your astonishment. Imagine your joy when the doctor, the only one who can do the surgery, calls you up and says, listen, I'm going to pay for the surgery for you. I'm the only one who can perform the surgery. I'm the only one who can heal you. And I know it costs a lot of money, but don't worry. I'll pay the price for you. Some of you already know where I'm going with this. You're already ahead. You're already ahead. I'll tell you what. I don't care how introvert you are. Your personality is going to change in that moment. You mean I was going to die. You mean I had no hope? You mean there was only one way and the doctor who could heal me not only is willing to fix me, but he's gonna pay for the surgery? You'd be telling everybody you know. You'd be on the phone. Man, you would have it on speakerphone. You'd be in the Starbucks. If you were now, you'd say, hey, listen, I don't know your name. What's your name? Nice to meet you. Yeah, let me tell you what happened to me. There was, I had cancer. And the doctor, he's the only one that can perform the surgery. And not only will he heal me, but he's going to pay for the surgery. You'd be telling everyone you know. You'd be jumping up and down. You'd be crying. Let me tell you something, my friend. You were lost. You were sinful. You were on your way to hell. And there was only one person that could save you. And not only did he provide and was willing to pay the way, he was willing to pay the price so you could be healed. I think I'll clap my hands for that one. <laughs> Understand this morning, how can we not praise the Lord? How can we not lift our hands? How can we not pray? How can we not get overwhelmed by the goodness of God? Listen, this morning, worship is not emotion, but worship is emotional. When you think, if I were to come home to my wife and I were to say, honey, you know that, that disease I have? The doctor said, he's gonna fix me and he's gonna pay for it. I don't have to pay anything. Oh, we'd be overwhelmed with the goodness of that doctor. We'd be overwhelmed with the grace of that doctor. We would, we would be overwhelmed with the, with the love and kindness of that doctor that we would tell everybody. We know it would change the way we live. It would change how we act. We wouldn't disrespect that doctor. We wouldn't push off that doctor. We wouldn't you know, misprioritize that doctor. Why? Because that doctor saved us and he was willing to pay the price. Are we understanding what we're trying to say here this morning? That Jesus Christ has come for us. We were sinful. We were lost. We had no hope, my friend. There is no other way to get to heaven but through Jesus Christ. And he provided the way and paid the price. And I might take five seconds on a Sunday just to clap a little bit and say, hey. We see the decibel of their praise. <laughs> they were excited. We see the details of their praise. What did they say? Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. In the next verse there, we see 
Hosanna, what, they, what, what are they saying? Let's, let's break it down. What are they saying? Hosanna means save us, please. That's what they were crying out. Save us, please. They were saying, save us, please. And then they were referencing Jesus to the son of David, which David was a powerful, well-known, influential king, one of the greatest kings in all of Israel. And there's a Masonic prophecy that says that the Messiah will come from his father David. He will sit on the throne of his father. He will come from that line. And we see that what they're saying is, save us, please, because you are a king like David. And he says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You represent, what they're saying is this, you represent the Lord as a king. And as a king who represents the Lord, you alone can save us. And we see when the people were praising God like this, we see in verse 10, the impact it made. Look at verse 10. It says, and when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, what is that? Who is this? I want you to notice that the way that they chose to live affected the people around them because they were not ashamed of who Jesus was. It intrigued those who did not know him. Who is this? Who is this that you're so excited about? Who is this that you're crying, save us? Who is this king I've never heard about? I wanna be free too. I don't wanna be oppressed anymore. Who is this? And we see their response impacted. And then we see that the city was stirred. The Bible says, and when they enter the, uh, Jerusalem, the, the whole city was stirred. That word stirred is in Greek. The New Testament is written originally in Greek. And that word stirred is co, co. It's the root word where it's, it's, it's connected to the word where we get seismo, seismo, which seismo is the Greek word for earthquake, seismograph. And the Bible says that, that the, the city was so stirred, it was like an earthquake. There was so much noise and commotion and shouting and praise and wondering and, and that it stirred up the whole entire city. And we see here, then the people were intrigued and they said, who is this? You see that what Jesus established in that moment was the fulfillment that he is the promise. Why? We see in the last part, who is this? Verse 11, it says, and the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Remember the title of our message, prophet, priest, and king? We see he's the prophet. He's the one that fulfills the promises that have been made. But then I want you to notice number two, and these next two points are half as long as the first one, okay? Good. I want you to notice the faithful priest. Jesus establishes himself as the fulfillment of God's promise, and then number two, as the faithful priest. We see in verse number 12, it says this, and Jesus entered the temple and drove out all of those who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. I love this verse right here. I'll tell you what, Jesus is not playing anymore. I mean, he's riding on that donkey. I mean, you know, he's coming down that hill and he's got his eyes set, man, on that temple, man. He's like, man, you better get me down, donkey. I'm about to tear something up down there. Well, I tell you what, you know, he's like, hey, hold my coat for a second here, man. Hey, John, hold my, he's running down that thing. And he get and, and the Bible, it's interesting because he rides in on this earthquake-like praise. I mean, it's like, you know, somebody walking in and people just cheering and he ignores all of that and he goes right for the temple. And he goes into the temple and he just starts cleaning house. It's like some of you moms, when you walk into your kid's bedroom, man, you're just like, get the, what is this there? Get this room cleaned up. Like Jesus in the temple, man. I'll tell you what. Some of you teenagers, your mom, she's just being spiritual, trying to help you, right? Should I cleanse that room? He starts flipping tables and he's, he pushes out. And the Bible says that he pushes away these that are selling money. Why would he do this? Because he is the faithful high priest. This was the responsibility. What was happening here was this, was that people would come from all over the land to sacrifice. Back in the Old Testament, they had sacrifices. But if you were traveling a day's journey, two days journey, it would be really difficult to bring a lamb with you all that way. So what they devised was a system that was good where they could come to the temple without an animal and then before they entered into the temple, they could buy an animal and then sacrifice it. It was kind of a convenience thing. 
What was happening though is the high priest and the leaders of the temple were allowing that, that exchange to happen inside the temple, not outside the temple. So they could sort of set the prices. Kind of, you know, hold on to the real estate. Oh, you're going to be in the temple? Okay, well, there's a little bit of premium for that, right? And so Jesus comes in and he disrupts this religious Ponzi scheme that's happening. And he is upset and he cleanses the temple. Why? Because the Bible says in Hebrews chapter five, they're not on the screen, but I'll read it to you. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, you are my son today. I have begotten you as he says also in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And we see what Jesus does here. What's he establishing? He establishes he is the promise of God, the donkey, right? He gets on the donkey. But then here we see in this next verse, in verse 13, what he establishes. We see he establishes authority over the temple. He says in verse 13, he said to them, it is written, what's the words? My house. My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers and he establishes in this moment that he is the high priest. That there is no priest greater than him. There is no religious figure that is more important than him. He's not filled with pride, he's filled with truth. And he is establishing that, hey, I oversee this temple. I oversee the worship of God. I am the faithful high priest. Stuart Weber said this, that the triumphal entry established Jesus as the Messiah King, the son of David who was entering his city and ascending to his temple. It was the king who entered the temple and challenged the corruption he found. Can I tell you say this, this morning, this house right here, this isn't my house. It's his house. He is the king. He is the high priest. He is the one who sets the rules. He is the one who comes in. And what Jesus was doing in this moment, he was saying, listen, you don't need this religious system anymore because I'm here now. Yes. He establishes himself as the perfect high priest who will offer a final sacrifice. And man, he flipped that table. He got those people out. And he, he was making a statement saying, you don't need this religious system anymore because in just a few days, I'm going to provide for you what this religious system would never provide for you. I'm going to give you salvation. I will be the lamb of God slain. There'll be no more need for sacrifices. There'll be no more need for coming to the temple. And he establishes his authority in the temple, and I want you to notice this in verse number 14. In verse 14, after he's in this sort of, you know, authority establishing mode, it says in verse 14, and the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. It's interesting, this story is found in all the gospels, but only in Matthew's gospel does he add this, this detail. I think it's a beautiful detail because it, it, it speaks to the significance and foreshadowing of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It speaks to the fact that Jesus established, don't miss this now, he establishes his authority in order to express his compassion. And he says, I am the high priest. I am the only way to heaven. I am the one. You don't need to sacrifice to me or to, 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 to lambs anymore. You sacrifice to me and I will heal you. And we see this, don't miss this, that these blind men and these lame uh, folks came to him and he had compassion on them. Can I tell you this morning that when you understand the authority of Jesus, he is not trying to crush you. He's not trying to hurt you. He's not trying to bash you. He's not trying to bully over you and tell you, hey, this is my house. You and do what I say. No, he's establishing his authority to push out those things that would want to hurt you, to push out those things that are going to crush you, to push out those people who are going to be against you. And then he sit, looks at you and he says, come to me. Come here. I'll heal you. I'll heal you with compassion. The beauty of Jesus in this passage. And what Jesus is doing to you this morning, he's saying, come to me. I know you're hurting. Come to me, see my authority. I will heal you. I will help you. I will restore you. I will encourage you. I will help you. I will be there for you. I will guide you. I will love you. 
I will be the one you can trust. I'm the one that will always be with you. I will never cast you out. I will never forsake you. He says, come to me. Why? Because you see my authority. You don't, think those, you don't think those men understood what was going on? They were like, whoa, what's all that banging and clanging going on over there? Is that Jesus? Is that Jesus? Oh, he's establishing what? He's a faithful high priest. And then I want you to notice lastly this morning, he establishes this truth that he's the formidable, powerful king. We see in verse number 15, we see the reaction from the religious. Look what it says in verse 15. He says, but when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Why were they mad? Well, I mean, they had a few reasons, right? Okay. But it's interesting, I want you to, I want you to miss this because there's, there's some details that Matthew puts in this gospel that we'll look at and then we'll be done and then we'll go to Chili's or wherever you guys have plans to go. The detail here, the reaction, the religious people, they got upset, they were indignant. They weren't just like sort of upset, like, like, like you know, some of the young folks say, like low key mad, you know what I mean? All right? That's all I know right there, that's all I know. I'm gonna go back to being 40 right now, okay? I'm back, right? They were mad. I mean, they were angry. Why? Because the people were, were looking to Jesus as the source of healing. The, the blind man came to him. The lame man came to him. And what, what they were saying in that moment was, wow, Jesus, what you're establishing is you're the, you're the fulfillment of God's promise. And you're the authority. You're the faithful high priest. If you have authority to come in and hit the, temp hit the tables out, you must be in charge. I'm coming to you for healing. And all of a sudden, these religious leaders start to see their religious system crumble. Their indoctrination crumble. Because their power crumble. Because Jesus now was becoming their source. It says in verse number 15, but when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he had done. What wonderful things? He healed people. He healed the blind. You would think a religious leader would be like, wow, that's awesome. You are blind. I can see. He said, oh no, not in my temple. Ain't gonna be healing people. We don't heal people here. We just keep them locked in chains and oppressed, thinking they are a slave to religion. And you're gonna go and heal them now? And we're upset. Well, notice the next part. He says this. They were indignant because he was being reverenced by the children. Don't miss this next part. He says this. Why were they mad? Verse 15. And the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David. They said, Jesus is messing up our religious indoctrination system. And they were mad. There was nothing they could do about the adults. I mean, they're adults, right? They can choose what they want to. They were upset because now Jesus was influencing the children. And they were so mad because they said this in their mind, they said, we cannot allow the children to be influenced by Jesus. And that's why five days later, they hung him on a tree. Nothing we can do about the adults. They've made their choice. But the children, the children are impressionable. The children are innocent. The children can be influenced. And if the children are crying out Hosanna to the son of David, we cannot allow this man, Jesus, to influence the children. And doesn't our society cry the same thing today? That as Jesus begins to change lives and heal families and, and give confidence to young people that our society cries out, we cannot allow Jesus to influence the children. And so they indoctrinate and they attack and they influence and they infiltrate and we sit passive. Can I tell you this morning, that what Jesus was doing here affects all of us. It even affects the children. 
that if we will not loudly proclaim who Jesus is, if we will not live like Jesus has called us to, if we will not see Jesus as the authority, if we will not see Jesus as the one who fulfills the promises, if we will not live as Jesus is the king, our children won't either. And the greatest thing that you may do and the greatest contribution that you may make to the kingdom of God is not something you do, but someone you raise. Mary raised Jesus. Hannah was the mother of Samuel. Moses, his mother, influenced him. And I'm telling you this morning that there is a, this is not the message, but it's in the message. And, there's an attack on the children. And if you think, I don't know about that, watch 15 minutes of the news and then turn it off. (laughs) There's an attack. There's a desire for the innocent, impressionable minds and hearts of the children. And society is not going to point them to Jesus. They're going to point them to some indoctrinating system that oppresses them and that binds them. And may we as disciples of Jesus Christ live faithfully and loudly to the point where we might get everybody, but they're not getting the children. They're not getting the children. You say, Pastor Steve, that sounds like a threat. It's not. I'm not a, I'm a lover, not a fighter. I promise you. (laughs) But I promise you what we'll, what we'll continue to do is this. We'll continue. We'll continue to have wonderful classes for children. We'll continue to stand up and preach the word of God. We'll continue to teach the parents what the Bible says, the truths of the word of God. And we'll continue to point the hearts and minds of the people in this room and the people in the nursery to the fact that Jesus is king. He is prophet. He is priest. And as the children would say, Hosanna to the son of David. He is king. He is king. And we see that Jesus refers them as they mad, and he says this, the response from Jesus, and I'm almost done, thank you. He says, he says in verse number uh, 16, it says, and Jesus said to them, or go back in verse 16, it says, and they said to him, do you hear what these are saying? The children. Like, are you gonna allow this? Are you gonna keep this going? I love what Jesus' response is in, um, in verse number uh, 17, I think it's 16 or 17, it's, and Jesus said to them, yes. <laughs> I love that, yes. I love that. Yes. Are you going to allow them to praise you? Yes. Are you going to allow them to worship you as king? Yes. Yes. Why? Because it's true. Why would I tell them to stop saying what's true? He says, yes. And then he says, don't, haven't you read? He always did this to the religious people. He says, haven't you read? Out of the mouth of babes. Out of the mouth of babes, I've prepared praise. And we see that Jesus is referencing that the way that we should look at Jesus is the way that children look at Jesus. With awe and wonder. This is why we teach the children, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. This is why we teach the children red and yellow, black and white. They're all precious in his sight. Yes, Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I can't remember the rest of the song. It's been too long since I sang it. For the Bible tells me so. There it is. Thank you, Spirit. And what Jesus is saying to them, what Jesus is saying to them, it speaks to you. Because what he's saying is, yeah, I hear what they're saying. And the way that they have believed on me is actually the way that you need to believe on me. The faith of a child. Mark chapter 10 says this, 
But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant. Notice the same word. <laughs> I love that. Jesus, they use the same word for Jesus here as they did for the religious, but notice the opposite. They were mad that the children were coming to Jesus. Jesus was mad that they were keeping the children from him. Indignant, and he said to them, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. The next verse says this, truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child, shall not enter it. What is he teaching there? And we're done. He's saying to them that the way that you ought to believe on me is not through your religious education. The way that you believe that I am the fulfillment, the way that you believe that I am the faithful high priest, I am the powerful king. The way that you're going to believe that is not through something you read in a book or something that you find on your own. You're gonna believe it when you have the faith of a child who stands at the edge of the pool and his father says, jump. And with all the belief in his heart and faith in his father, he leaps into the air, confident that his father will catch him, protect him, love him, keep him safe and save him. That is the same way, my friend, this morning. You don't have to have a religious education. You don't have to go to church. You don't have to be baptized. All you need to do is believe in who Jesus has said and established he is. He is the only king. He is the only priest. He is the only prophet. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And so this morning, let's look at a few decisions we can make and we're done. Easter will be a shorter message, I promise. We got two services, so. We already know what happened anyway. We already know the end of the story, right? He's risen. Let me give you a couple of decisions to make and we'll be done. Number one, what do I do with this message, Pastor? I learned to live, okay? We've learned, now let's live. How does that affect my life? Number one, maybe you need to respond to Jesus with obedience this week and just say, you're the king. Just like the disciples responded with obedience, I'll get the donkey, you respond with obedience. Maybe for some of you, you need to stop believing religion can save and trust in Jesus as Savior. Maybe you'd let go of some religious system and believe that he is who he says he is and that he is the only way to heaven. For some, maybe you'd be bold and invite one person to Easter, that you'd live loud like these disciples did that affected others around them. And for some, maybe simply come next week and let's celebrate the conclusion of what he establishes here, that he is the king. He is the priest. He is the fulfillment. And we see the culmination of that when he hangs on a cross, is buried, and then three days later, he rises again. And it confirms what is established here. He is who he says he is. And I pray that he would be that in your life. That when you're, when you're feeling abandoned, that he is the faithful priest when you're feeling like something's not coming through, that you would look to him as the fulfillment of the promise. That when you're worried about the future, you would trust that he is king and he is ruler over all things. That he has established his authority. When you're fearful of what's going to happen, you're not sure where to turn, that you would not turn to your own solutions, but you would turn to who Jesus is. And the truths that he establishes here would affect your life on Tuesday and Wednesday, and that you would live as a disciple, fully believing, fully trusting, fully embracing who Jesus is. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. God, we just pray that you would help us to understand the truths and the power of your word. God, speak to us now, we pray.